good. Thank you very, very much. What a message. In Exodus chapter 33 and verse 12, Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If I have found favor in your eyes, teach me your ways, so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember, this nation is your people. I have a friend who is pastor in Atlanta, and his church was right off of Peachtree Street, very busy street, of course. He counted some thousands and thousands of cars that drove by his church every day, and he was afraid they didn't even know his church was there. So he got together with some people, and they decided to put a sign up on Peachtree Street right by the curb, and the sign said, If you're tired of sin, come on in. And all those thousands of church, uh, cars drove by his church. They saw the sign, If you're tired of sin, come on in. And one day someone wrote at the bottom, If not, call 755-3344. There are a lot of people who are not tired of sin, I guess, in our society, but the fact is everyone does get tired of sin. It not only takes years from life, it takes life from years. But today I'd like for us to talk about another group of people, a people who want to serve God and who get tired of doing good, people who want to do the thing that pleases God and yet seem to not find the energy or the strength to do that, is there any answer for those who get tired of doing good and do become weary in well-doing? Well, you need to know the truth about Moses. And these scriptures we've read have talked about the truth about Moses, about how he understood as he came into this greatest challenge of his life that he needed something he didn't have. In fact, Moses' great secret was that he knew he couldn't do it. But you say, but he did it. It's true, but he never did it until he knew he couldn't do it. Now, when Moses was 40 years of age, when he was the part of the ruling class of the Egyptian empire, when he wore the most significant and fine clothes anyone could wear, when he rode in the, in the very best chariot anyone could commandeer or astride the greatest and most impressive horse and livered better than any other around, when he was in line for the throne, when he was 40 years old, he was a man of power, a man of position, a man of great education, a man of great ability. In Acts 7, when Stephen is talking about him, he said he was a man who was mighty in deeds and in words. And when he was that kind of person, he tried hard to do the thing that God is calling him to do now some 40 years later. And he said very wisely, Lord, I cannot do it. I've tried it, and I fail miserably, and I simply cannot do it. You've been telling me, lead these people, but I tell you, I cannot do it. I've tried it. They did not follow me. They would not do this when I was much more impressive than I am now. Back then, I was in the line of authority of the Egyptian empire. Now, I'm an 80-year-old sheep herder who doesn't even own the sheep. I can't do it. And that's when God has you ready to be used. When you know that you cannot do it in your strength, that's when he's ready. It's interesting to see in the Word of God that people that God uses are people who are usually broken. They're not proud. They're not mighty. They are not self-assured. They are not people of great position or honor normally. They are people who have been broken. And out of that brokenness comes the power of God. It's Isaiah refusing to say the things that would please the people and rather saying the things that would please God and, and in the dungeon up to his waist in mire. It's Ezekiel because he was doing the things that God would have him to do, had to eat barley cakes, mingle with manure just to exist. It is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walking into a fiery furnace because of their faith in God. It is, it is Daniel walking in to face the lions even though he was assured it would be his last day, but God saved him in all of that. It's the brokenness. I heard one church pastor say one time that the one requirement that he required for every member of his staff is that they have been broken, that they've been through a time when they realize they can't do it. 
that they do not have what it takes to do it, and they must have God's help. They can't do it. And so God said to him, the Lord said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Moses had asked two of the questions we always ask when we're trying to find the thing that we should be doing with life and facing the challenge of life. He was saying, who's going to go with me? I cannot do it alone. Who's going to go with me, and how am I going to know that it's God's will? And God answered those two questions by saying, I will go with you, I will be with you, I will t tell you and show you my will, and I will give you rest. Now, what does that mean? He's going to give us rest. Does it mean, Moses, if you do this thing, I've got a great retirement plan for you. Man, I'll put you in a place where there's a golf course in your front yard and a well-stocked bass pond in the backyard and a hammock in between. No, he's saying, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to give you strength that you don't have. You shall do this in the power of my might. I'm going to give you rest. The knowledge that you're doing this with me, that we walk side by side, that you and I are in this thing together, I am going to give you rest. That's exactly what Jesus meant when he said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. You remember the, the situation when Jesus said these things? It was five o'clock about in the afternoon. In that hard-working, burdened-down slave society, there were people going to work and coming from work. The farmers were coming in from a hard day in the field. The fishermen were going out for a hard night's fishing. And Jesus stood, and it wasn't just a kind of a conversational thing. The Scripture says that he stood at the crossroads there. He saw all those people, and he almost shouted to them, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and my burden is easy, and my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. He said, I'm trying to tell you the easiest way to live is to yoke up in life with me. Now, you know that a yoke was an apparatus that allowed two animals to pull the same load together. And in telling us to yoke up with him, Jesus, who had been a carpenter, who had made yokes to fit tailor-made animals that were beasts of burden, he was saying, you take off every yoke that you have in life, everything that's pulling you down, all the things you're trying to do by yourself, you take that off, you put on my yoke with me, and we will face life's pull together, and this is going to be the easiest way for you to live. That's God's promise. My burden is light. My yoke is easy. You yoke up with me, and this will be life's pull for us together, and it's the easiest way to live. When I was younger, in fact, it was 40 years ago almost, I'd just gotten out of seminary. I was associate pastor in a fine church in a city of 35,000 people, and I decided I was going to win that city for Christ. I worked hard every day, long into the night, I knocked on doors. I visited everyone I could. Night after night, I would stay out late knocking on doors and trying to win people to Jesus. I was going to make some difference in that town. I was going to do the best I could do to win people for Christ. And my friends kept coming to me and saying things like, Frank, you're, you're, you're killing yourself. And that sounded so good to me. He said, you're sure I, I can see the deal. So, so thrilled by the prospect of that. I, I could see uh, the, the wreath right there by the head of the casket. Great giant flowers, and it'd be a white, wide uh, sheath of a ribbon with golden letters in glitter that said, He killed himself for the Lord. And I could see my wife and our little baby boy with such cherubic looks on their faces, such smiles, so sweet. They were so proud of me because I killed myself for the Lord. And I could just picture all of that. But God is good. I didn't die because of it. I developed an ulcer. And I went to see the doctor, and he was a good Christian man, a member of our church. And he, he drew a picture of a wheel, 
And on that wheel, there were four spokes. And he named those spokes work and worship and play and love. And he said, and when those spokes are the proper length, then the wheel runs smoothly and life goes smoothly. When the one of them is too long or too short or not there, then life gets out of round and you have this terribly terrible time. You need to balance your life. And he said, and you need to understand, don't ever do anything for God without God. Because in life, we don't do things for God. We don't do things for ourselves that are spiritual and religious things. We don't try to work our way to heaven. We don't do things for God. We do things with God. Jesus said, yoke up with me. Face this pull with me. Learn what it is to develop a time with me. Do things with God. That's what's so very, very important. And Moses began to do things with God. And he faced many challenges in life as he did that. He learned that not only can you not do things by yourself without God, you can't do things by yourself without others. He began to realize the lesson of God putting other people in his life to work with him. And that's what church and life is all about. It's God putting people together and helping each other and being a support to each other and none of us doing our thing in such an individual, independent way that we, we think we can do it by ourselves. We don't need God. In Numbers chapter 11, we begin to read of a very famous episode in the life of Moses. It said, the rabble with them began to crave other food. And again, the Israelites started wailing and said, if only we had meat to eat. We remember what we had to eat in Egypt. Why, there was fish, and there were cucumbers and melons and leeks and onions and garlics, but now we don't have an appetite because all we have is manna. We have manna for breakfast. We have manna for lunch. We have manna for dinner. All we have is manna. We're sick and tired of manna. We've had manna burgers and manna sandwiches and manna salad and manna shakes. We, we're tired of manna. Give us something to eat. And Moses faced that from two to five million people. Give us something to eat. We're not being fed. You know, sometimes as a pastor, I have people come to me and say, you're not feeding us. Just not too long ago, some man came. He made a suggestion. I'd like to take a vote on this. But he said, what you really ought to do is spend the whole hour teaching the Word of God. And when we come together on Sunday morning, you ought to preach for an hour. Anybody want to vote on that? I, I told him that, uh, that we were involved in the ministry of the Baptist Hour across the nation, that many times on radio all the time and the Baptist Hour television has a 30-minute format that if the sermon lasts more than 22 to 25 minutes, it doesn't fit that format. That didn't make a bit of difference to him. He said, you really ought to preach for an hour. You're not feeding us. And I thought, do you only eat the things of God, the Spirit of God and the Word of God, when you, when you come to the, to the Lord's house, don't you have a quiet time in the morning? Don't you have a Bible you can read yourself? Don't you know that 24 hours a day there are television and radio stations with, with people on them teaching the Word of God? This is not the only place to eat. And every time somebody says, you're not feeding me, I feel like saying to them, eat. You know, just eat. It's It's there. Go ahead and eat. And these people were fussing about not having the right things to eat, and they were saying, you're not feeding us, you're not helping us. And Moses went to the Lord in this chapter 11 of Numbers, and he said to him, Lord, how can I take care of all these people? This is just too much. I can't handle it. It's just too much. In verse 16, the Lord said, Bring me 70 of Israel's elders who are known to you as leaders and officials of the people. He said, pick out 70 good people to help you and, and share this thing and get us kind of a little bit organized and make things go right and, and share this thing and make sure that all the bases are touched. Find 70 good people to help you. We need each other. We need each other very, very much. People sometimes ask me, Frank, how in the world can you keep such a good staff together at First Baptist Jackson? My friends who know me well say, Frank, you've, you've gotten people together who are smarter and brighter than you are, and yet they keep staying here, they keep doing this wonderful job, and they do this. How can you do that? And I say, well, it's God who does that because he's good to us. But the fact is that 
God always does not do his work just through one person, not even a Moses. He always has the people there with the different gifts and the different things, and I'm so grateful. I, I could spend the rest of this day and probably some more days talking about the people that God has given us in this church to put together the programs, the leaders, so the people we're honoring and, 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 and highlighting today are, are outstanding in what they do. We're so grateful for that. I'm so thankful that God sent Jim Baker. He, uh, he has gifts that I don't have. He's a great gift of administration. He has a great love of the Lord Christ in that. He's been in our church almost 15 years. There's Larry Black, who's been here 28 or 29 years now. He is the leader of music ministers in this country. He is the dean of music ministers. I'm so thankful. He's one of the most committed and smartest people that I've, I've ever been around. I'm so thankful for him. Ken Lundquist has more than 20 years looked after the business management of this church, and it's a job, and he does it better and with, with more of a, an insight of character that, that many people have. I thank God so much for him. I could just go on and on and on and thanking God for people that he has put here in, in helping us, and I'm grateful, so very, so very, very and grateful and Moses realized this was this was a principle of leadership he needed to apply he brought together 70 of these wonderful people and then they began to do their ministry an interesting thing happened as they began to prophesy they began to preach and to teach God's Word and to do the thing that that they were helping Moses do all of a sudden people came to Moses and said to him Moses these people are doing what you're supposed to be doing they're they're taking over from you they're trying to make things their own and Moses said I would to God that all of his people were prophets I wish everybody could serve the Lord in this way and I'm not a bit jealous about all of this well he faced that and he faced his family not understanding what he was doing it says in chapter 12 and verse 1, Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife. Has the Lord spoken only through Moses, they ask? Hasn't he also spoken through us? And the Lord heard this. Now Miriam and Aaron were Moses' brother and sister. And they began to talk about him among the people. He had given them places, positions of high leadership and they were close to him and he began, they began to badmouth him among, among all the people. Now what does Moses do? The Lord heard this and you'll read in the scripture that the Lord immediately struck her with leprosy. I mean he gave her this terrible, incurable, ugly skin disease. And what did Moses do? Way to go Lord, you really zapped her. I mean she sure deserved that going around saying all these bad things about me. No, that's not what he did. He prayed for her. He prayed for her healing. He prayed for her so strongly that God answered his prayer and reduced that thing very, very much because Moses prayed for her. And then the whole country, all those millions of people began to rebel about him. Remember in chapter 13 of Numbers, the, the 12 spies were sent out to see the promised land and they were gone 40 days and they came back and two of them, Joshua and Caleb, said, man, it's great. There's some struggles there, but God is with us. He's going to help us. But 10 of them said, man, this would be the dumbest thing in the world for us to do. We can't do it. There's giants in the land. They're well fortified. There are walls around the cities uh, where we would just be committing suicide if we went in and tried to take this land. And Moses fell on his face before them and prayed for them. And God says, how long am I going to put up with these people? In verse 11 of chapter 14, the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me? In spite of all the miraculous signs I have performed among them, I will strike them down with a plague and destroy them, but I will make you into a nation greater and stronger than they. How would you react when you heard that? Putting up with all the griping and the rebellion of the people and saying we need to go back and we're not going to follow Moses and he's got us into trouble. We don't like this. What would you do if you were Moses when the Lord said, I'm getting rid of them. I'm going to make you one of the greatest people in all the world. I'm going to make a, you a nation stronger than these people could ever be. What did Moses say? Lord, I'm so glad. I, I'm humbled by this and I appreciate it. He said, oh God, please don't do that. God, please forgive these people. Please help these people. Don't bring the punishment upon them that you said that you would. And God didn't punish them because of the sins of Moses. And then there came a time in chapter 16 where his, his 
closest leaders rebelled against him. So they became insolent in the first verse and rose up against Moses. And with them were 250 Israelite men, well-known community leaders who had been appointed members of the council. They came as a group to oppose Moses and Aaron and said to them, You've gone too far. This whole community is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is with them. Why then do you set yourself above the Lord's assembly? And so once again, they rebelled against, against Moses and against Aaron. It says in verse 20, Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Separate yourselves from this assembly so I can put an end to them at once. He said, Moses and Aaron, get away from them. Get a safe distance from them. They're about to be blown off the face of the earth. We don't want you to get hurt in the repercussion. Once again, what did Moses say? He bowed and he said, Oh God, please don't do this. Please forgive these people. Please use them. Please honor them. And he bowed and let God know how much you love the people and care. If you really want to be powerful in this world for God, you learn to love like that. Jesus said that, didn't he? He said in Matthew 5, verse 46 or so in there, he said anybody can love their neighbors and love their friends and hate their enemies. But I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for them. People who talk about you, don't talk back about them. People who treat you terribly, don't treat them the way they treated you. Do good to them that hurt you and pray for them that despise you. He was being, as Jesus said, a real man is, a real person is when they follow the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our calling. The Sermon on the Mount is for you and me. And we're to learn this from Moses. We're to learn we can't do it ourselves. We're to learn that, that we cannot do it without the help of others. And we are to learn that when others let you down, we are to pray for them and love them and never be the kind of person who would retaliate and hurt them. Let me close quite quickly with two stormy sea boat stories. One time Jesus had fed the 5,000. He, he's wanted to be alone and pray and spend time with his father. That was very, very important to him. And he sent the apostles across the Sea of Galilee on the boat. The storm came up. They were rowing against the storm. They were afraid they were about to perish. Jesus, remember, came walking on the water. And the Scripture says that he would have walked on by them if they hadn't called out. He would have walked on by. Listen, Jesus will let you row your boat if that's what you want to do, but you're never going to get anywhere if you do it. He's not going to help you unless you want him to. He will let you be independent. He will let you row your own boat. But you need to understand that in so doing, you will fail. Another boat story. Sea of Galilee. Storm came up quickly again. Jesus was in the boat. He was asleep. And these men came to him and they said, Lord, don't you care if we perish? We're about to go down. Do something. Do something. And Jesus talked to them about their faith. And in essence, he said to them, if I'm in the boat, it's not going to sink. And I think if you can learn that, if you can learn that, you don't have to row the boat by yourself. If you can learn that if Jesus is in the boat, it's not going to sink, then you can know what it is to have the questions answered. Who's going to go with me? How am I going to know it's the right thing to do? And how am I going to find the strength to do it? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your grace, your love, your wisdom. Father, I pray you'll guide us in this moment. Lord, may we never take it lightly that we're standing in the presence of a Lord God who wants us, who needs us, who calls us, who will use us if we'll give ourselves. Lord, help us give ourselves in whatever way is appropriate right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you come profess faith in Christ? Come schedule your baptism. Come move your membership to our church. Come do that thing that would honor God and would bless you and put you in a great position of blessing. Let's stand quietly and reverently, and you come just now.